Good afternoon, everybody. It is 10, 9, something. And uh, this is Luke D. Honors Bio 2, Mechanisms of Cancer, December 4th? You, no, you can talk. 5th. Okay, I'm with uh, Savage here and Chartuni. Um, and so we're going to try to have class together now. So here we go. Um, do you guys remember this from the last one? What's this? Do you remember the slide? What is it for? Right, you put your DNA in the kit in the mail. And what happens after you put your DNA in a kit in the mail? Right, so you can, so kind of by guess, guessing, you guys might have to sit here so this thing can hear you. So by guessing what uh, what comes from your father and what comes from your mother, you figure out like how much of a percent of a disease you have or a chance you have for a disease. But here's a question: Why? So why isn't it that when I tell you you have a gene, then your chances aren't like a hundred percent? Like if you have the gene, then you have the disease. It might be activated or it might be silenced. What? Epigenetics, certainly. So basically, there's more to getting the phenotype for a disease than just having a gene, right? Is that always the case? I don't think so. No, that's not always the case. There's sometimes chances when you have a gene and that gene means that you get the disease, right? So I think it's best if, we, if I just try like talking directly to you. All right, so um, the reason, so there's like a lot of other reasons that, or a lot of other steps in between just having a gene and getting it expressed. So for example, in Huntington's, if you have Huntington's disease, or the gene, you have Huntington's disease. There's no if, and, or buts. And the reason for that is, is that the Huntington gene is always expressed, always. It's never not expressed. Um, but in most genes, you have like an upstream activated element, you have transcription factors, and depending on whether or not you have these upstream activated elements or these transcription factors, then you would have a gene be expressed or not expressed. Okay? Uh, and this is just showing multiple upstream activated elements. Okay, so do you remember what this map is? are actually logical dependent lines. And each line represents a gene. And so when there's a red line like that, that means that the gene is on. And when there's a green line like that, that means it's off. And when there's a black line, that means it's actually somewhere in the middle. Part of it's, so we're talking about DNA methylation specifically here. So that would mean like, for example, that this gene, whatever it is, in the prostate, in cells in the prostate is off. It's, it's very highly methylated. Um, this gene up here in the prostate is not methylated, so it can easily be read. You look like you're going to fall asleep. You can't look like you're going to fall asleep in a class of two people. All right. This is what happens when you cause, or when you change a protein slightly. So this is the normal protein. Um, instead of calling most things normal in bio, call them wild type because there's really nothing normal, right? So it's like, which is normal, blue, blue eyes or brown eyes? It, you don't know, right? But blue eyes, but brew, brew, brown, brown, brown are more common, right? Thank you. So they are the wild type. Oh, wait, maybe I should explain the other things in that, huh? So if you change the gene of a protein a little bit, um, you can sometimes just change one part of it, and that can be a small change in the shape, which can cause loss of function. It can also change, it can also do gain of function or additional loss of function. You can have um, a pretty big change, which would result in cutting off the protein fairly early. So that would be like if you had an early stop codon, right? So like UAG is a stop codon. Um, and if you had like UAC somewhere and that C mutated to a G, oh, 
it would stop way too early before it came out, right? Yeah. So what would happen to the protein? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to work. Right, but as far as length goes, shorter. it'd be a lot shorter, and then it probably wouldn't work. But it could, really weird possibility, it could actually gain some new function. So, for example, if the part that was lost was like an inhibitory domain, and then it would be on all the time, right? So you, you never really can predict what's happening with these proteins. And actually, um, if you know that smart team poster, mm -hmm. so that 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 computer, which is the size of like this room, that actually is dedicated to seeing how very very small molecules fold. And the fold it program, did you guys play with that yeah. for the honors project? So they're using a different tap. They're tapping into the human brain as um, the human brain has an amazing ability to see patterns. So they're thinking without actually figuring out how the brain does it, if they can just see how brains in general predict patterns in proteins, they can actually use you, your brain power, to figure out how things fall. I think it's kind of cool. You don't know? Really, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. That is so cool. Yeah, right. Um, OK. <laughs> Jerks. Um, so this is a gene, gnome, or DNA. And uh, what I'm trying to show here is that sometimes this gene might cross over. But if it crosses over, it's not going to cross over by itself. Okay. So it's going to cross over with at least some other parts of it. It might cross over with this much. It might cross over with this much. Go outside. Go away. Or you can come in. One person. Go back. Close the door. Lock it. Yes, actually lock it. Make me a video. I'll watch. Hey, you can join. No, lock it, lock it, lock it, lock it, lock it, lock the door. Lock the door. The door is locked. Lock the door. Once now. the door closes, it will lock the door. I'm making a video. Okay. So when it hi guys. And so now now we have Pip's Claw, um, Mora Ash, and San Miguel. Um so Yeah, that's it. Um So this is how you can tell. So this picture is how you know, how we know whether how genes are, are passed on. So you can't actually just look at a gen genome and you can't say like, oh, you have the Huntington's gene. Um, that's a rare case. So for a disease, if we don't know what it is and we're trying to figure out where it is, for example, with the, we did the um, sumo rat, right? Yeah. Okay, so for sumo rat, do you remember what other characteristic followed sumo rat? The, yeah, crooked tail, right? So in that kind of example, what you might have is the defective gene here and the crooked tail here, gene here. So those two things, because they're so close together, would usually cross over together. Um, and because you can very easily see the crooked tail allele, you can find out when it's crossing over. And therefore, look right around it for the disease gene. Does that make sense? You, you have to say yes because we're being yeah. recorded. Yes. Yeah, yes, it makes sense. So, Pip, say yes enthusiastically, like it's an epiphany. Yes. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, we were talking earlier with these guys about, like, why in Huntington's, when you have the gene, you have a disease, right? Mm -hmm. But in most things, it's not like that. And we're talking about why. And one of the things we already covered was that epigenetics might have the gene on or off. So, whether you have the gene, if you have the gene and it's off, it's going to be like you don't have the disease, right? Yeah. Or if you have the gene and then it gets turned off because of some behavioral thing, um, then you don't have the gene. For example, that happens in abuse and anxiety, right? So uh, genes that regulate anxiety or help you to regulate anxiety are turned off. And as honor students, honestly, you probably have a high level of anxiety. And it's actually... It's actually useful to you to a degree. Like, no joke, your ability, the, so the abilities that you consider are part of your personality, your critical and analysis ability, your overthinking skills, your ability to predict, are all basic protection mechanisms that you have. So those that are very, very comfortable and not anxious at all, don't look too far into the future. Whereas most of you actually plan out and try to predict what's happening more. Kind of weird, huh? All right. So. Another thing that could affect whether you have a, if you have the gene, you have the disease, um, is whether the protein, whether you have, 
you have two versions of a gene. Each version, if one version is going to be made, the other one is going to be made as well, most likely. So if you have a gene, and let's say we have this anxiety gene, um, and one works, and you have two copies of the same thing, then both works. And you have anxiety. You have the gene, and you're anxious. But what happens if you have one copy of the gene that makes you anxious and one copy of the gene that makes you anxious, but it doesn't work? Still be anxious. You still be anxious. Would you be half as anxious? No, just as anxious. Go ahead. It depends on production of the gene. What part of the, hey, I didn't even know you were here. Um, what part of the gene determines whether or not, or how much a gene is, a protein is made? Uh, the binding site? No, the what? The transcription factor. The transcription factor. Right. Um, okay, what if I have two versions of the anxious gene that doesn't work? You're not anxious. Okay, so here's a visual representation of that. Um, so, but this is slightly different, right? So this is parts of a protein. So each allele or gene is making the same thing, but you need two of them to make a receptor. Okay, you see it? So here, let's say this is the anxious receptor. Um, is the anx anxious receptor functioning? Yes. Are both copies of the, are both alleles the same? Yes. Yes, okay. So let's look here. Are both alleles the same? Okay, do you get anxious? Uh, well, if it's the one on the left, yes, but the other two, no. So you have to realize that each one of these is going to be produced because there's not one of these proteins being made. There's like a kajillion of them being made. My guess would be it yeah. depends. Um, so you would still be anxious, you just wouldn't be anxious as much. As well, because what's the effect of this allele um, or this protein when it's combined with this protein. It, yeah, it, it prevents it from also function. Right. Um, and you can actually figure out the percentages here, and it's really, really easy. If uh, What you do is you call this A and you call this B, right? And so what's the chance of this right one being A? It's really easy. You have two choices. It's one and two, right? So it's 50%. So you would say that this, the chance of this one is 0.5A. Okay? And what's the chance that it's going to be B? So this, together, the chance is equal 100%. So you say 0.5A plus 0.5B. Right? And then what are the chances for this one being A? Same thing. Right? So it's plus 0.5A plus 0.5B again. So really what that works out to is 0.5A plus 0.5b squared. Because the chance of having them both is like exponentially. So, well, what you'll see here is that you have a 25% chance of having a and a, a 50% chance of having a and b, and a 25% chance of having b and b. Okay, so what, what is the percent of recept working receptors here? 25%. It's 25%. Right. So you, you see right away that the, the way that proteins affect each other really affects the relationship about how many are made. Oh, dear. Okay, so now I have four pieces that I need to make a protein. What happens if one of them doesn't work? Does that make the effect of the inactive one greater or lesser? Um, greater. So, well, greater. The question is, if I have four pieces that are required for a protein, and one of them is inactive, so I have an inactive gene, or a gene that makes an inactive protein, and a gene that makes an active protein, okay? So I have three active versions here and one inactive. What is the, the whole overall thing? Inactive. It's inactive. Let's say something has to go through the middle, through this area here, right? So this is inactive. So what are my chances of this one? Well, oh. well if there are only two proteins that go into it, then it's? It would be 50% chance. 
So let's call this one A and this one B. So this one, the chance of getting uh, anything here would be 0.5 this one and 0.5 this one, right? So the equation for this one would be 0.5A plus 0.5B to the fourth. And then you solve that, and then you would see your percentage of each of the combinations. And I'll show you how to solve that. Do you guys know how to solve that? Yeah. Um, Easily. Just, yeah, if yeah. you use the triangle, what's it called? Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle. Yeah, that is the best oh, way. Oh, yeah, 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 that okay. That is the best way to do that. All right, so maybe we'll do it that way. Um, that most people use Punnett squares. That's silly. Pascal's triangle is so much easier. Oh, uh, we'll see. All right, so, but the relationship isn't always that easy. Right? So what happens if I have, let's say, the anxious, again, the anxious receptor, and we have a slight mutation in it, slight differences in it? One of them is activated at 37 degrees, one is activated at 25 degrees. What then? It depends on the temperature, right? Do the percentages become as simple here? No, it becomes suddenly far more complicated and now dependent on the temperature. So in a, addition to, like, epigenetic factors, what alleles you have, whether those alleles are transcribed, and you now have introduced temperature into the equation. So a disease might have all those factors. So just because you have the gene, it might be below, I don't know, 25 degrees, and neither of these might be working. All right. Now let's say that we've talked about, we've talked about individual proteins up to now. Now let's look at this picture. So this is how you get hungry. So hungry, the, the feeling is based on, and you can inject it. I can inject hungry into you, right? So a feeling like that, I can put in a tube. You can put hunger in a tube. Does nobody find that interesting? Can you put like love in the tube? That's what I'm working on. I mean, that's not what I'm working on. but that's. So tomorrow's <laughs> journal club presentation is actually, can you put monogamy in a tube? Can you put monogamy? So I don't know if that's love or not, but the desire to stay with a single person, can you put that in a tube? Um, all right. So hunger, the feeling of hunger is based on very many things. It's based on, um, I don't know what PYY is. I always forget. But ghrelin is based on the size of your stomach, so how much is food is literally in your stomach. Um, how much sugar uh, your pancreas is detecting, right? That, that plays on insulin. And then how much fat you have. So if you're anticipating sugar, you release insulin. You get hungry. If your stomach is full, you get not hungry. And if you have a lot of fat, you also get not hungry. So in a situation where there, we're anticipating sugar, but we're overweight, what would happen is the uh, pancreas would say, let's produce insulin, let's make us hungry. The stomach would say, I'm empty, let's make us hungry. And then the fat would say, wait, we've got way too much fat here. We should probably not eat. They all send their signal to one area. But and then, be more than what's that? Isn't there going to be more hungry than not hungry? Well, the point is, is that there's now three different proteins working on one effect. So just because you had um, an overacting leptin, for example, or gene for overactive leptin doesn't mean that you're always not hungry, right? Because you could be producing way too much insulin, so that would make you hungry. Or that your ghrelin could be mutated so that it always says, I'm, I'm very hungry. And those could override that. So then you might have the gene for not hungry in the form of leptin, but your insulin and ghrelin genes might override it. So the question we're trying to answer the whole time is, if I have the Huntington's gene, I have the Huntington's disease. Why is it not like that for most things? And one of the answers here is that it's a lot of different proteins involved. This is a Huntington's example. Uh, I can't remember what. Yeah, I do. I don't know why, how it fits, though. Oh, right, right. So uh, it's just looking at simple systems and then kind of trying to figure out which is more complex. Um, which is the more complex system here by far, the phone or the fly? Fly. It's the fly by like magnitudes. So the fly is hundred, at least hundred times faster in processing than the phone. 
actually, as far as just visual systems go, it's several thousand times faster. Um, basically, it's just more complicated than you think it is. All right. So these are all, again, kind of examples of genes, like in summary, um, things that would affect when you have the gene and when do you have the effect of that gene. So, right, you can have epigenetic shutdown um, from birth. You can have BPE, something like that, some environmental factor influencing shutdown. You can have, I don't remember how that plays in. Oh, yeah, lots of different genes, lots of different things affecting one kind of um, outcome. Made me think of hallmarks. Right, right. You can have differences in cytoplasm. You can have differences in signaling, which would affect differences in upstream activators and transcription factors, and then the idea that several proteins need to work together. Um, and so really, the idea of what makes us human, or what makes us us, is a combination of all of these things. It's not just your genetics. And that's why when you get your map back from 23andMe, it doesn't say, you have this gene, therefore you have this effect. Okay, so the summary slide here. No, go big. Go big. No. No. Ah. Okay, so this is a little bit confusing, ready? But this is the modern view of genetics. And this is why I don't call it genetics, too, as well. So in the example of the purple flower, you have the purple gene. That's big P. First of all, nobody names things big P and little p. You will never, ever, ever see that in a paper. And if you do, take the paper, throw it on the ground, and start jumping on it. And, and, and a voodoo curse as well. Where was supposed to learn the voodoo curse? I don't know, internet? <laughs> voodoo people. John Crowley Delman, I'm pretty sure he knows who to. Yeah. Um, OK, but anyway, you have the purple gene. When you have the purple gene, you make the purple transcript, which means you make the purple protein, which means you get the purple flower. Really oversimplified example. First of all, you're not flowers. <laughs> Chartuni, you might be. <laughs> I do smell good. Yeah. <laughs> Compelling argument. Um, all right, but for let's let's look at in a much more in a much more real situation um, how things work. So first of all, you'd have to have whether or not you're this is a the a brown gene. So it's agouti, you know it from the agouti mice, hopefully from the honors projects. Um, okay, so this is the name agouti related protein. That's the name of the gene. All capitals, it's four letters. It, they're usually some version of that. Um, so you first try to figure out whether it's on or off from your mom. Then you figure out which version you have. And notice you don't just have big P and little p. Right? You have all these different versions, wild type, um, the AGRP that makes you obese, AGRP with 137 mutated. Um, you can also, there's, a, there's like a simple hand. So if you have one version that makes you obese and one version that's just regular, you can call it like, obese wild type like this. Or if you wanted to say obese, obese, you would just go like obese plus plus. And this would be obese plus minus. But you will see those. Those are OK. So um, the idea that even though you have this gene and directly you get this, this effect of obese, you still got a lot of other things happening. right? So after you have, what, depending on what version of the gene you have, then you have your environmental factors that will affect your epigenetics that can affect its being on. Then you can affect whether or not the transcription of the gene takes place by transcription factors and upstream activating elements. The transcript of HERP is called FOX01. No. FOX01 is an inhibitor of AGRP. Okay, so. No, trans FOX01 is a transcription factor for AGRP, sorry. Um, so that will be required for this to be produced. Um, and then you have upstream activating elements. Then you have other pieces of RNA 
right, which can act as far as RNAi interference, interference in shutting down that gene, um, or it could produce a protein that will further down the line shut down AG, uh, the agouti protein. Um, actually, and the, the idea that you get one protein from a gene, you get, can get several because of splicing. You can get several proteins. For example, agouti is what makes you fat. Eumelanin is what makes you brown. But they both come from the AGRP gene after it's cut. So then you have to realize that melanin, leptin, and insulin all affect agouti and eumelanin. So leptin is a not hungry, or leptin is a not hungry signal, insulin is a hungry signal, melanin is a brown signal. So these all affect the outcome of this one gene. And then you have the actual result, like whether you're obese, how brown you are, whether you have a kinky tail. Is that a tear? Yeah. Kinky tail? Yeah. Oh, right. Um, OK, so anyway, that's the point. There's no relationship direct. Most genes don't have a direct relationship between presence of the gene and the end phenotype. And the reason that's really important is because when you're thinking about diseases like cancer and things like that, the, the hunt for the gene for is always in the news. And then you find the gene, and guess what? It doesn't help you. Right? So the Human Genome Project was like, okay, let's find all the letters. Yay, go. And then we're like, done. And like, crap, we still don't know anything. Right? And I don't want you, I specifically don't want you in your heads thinking that dominant and recessive presence of a gene and not presence of a gene are all things you need to look at. So from here on out, when you're considering what's the relationship between an end disease or, or anything, hair color, eye color, skin color, nose color, I don't know why nose color would be <laughs> distinguished from skin color, but let's just say it's possible, Morass, okay? Um, so in the end, those are the, the effects. There might be several proteins that lead to that effect. A gene that might be related might make several proteins that affect those proteins that would end up making the effect. You could have RNAi interference, which either activated or inactivated the RNA transcript. You could have transcription factors or lack of transcription factors. You can have environmental factors that affect epigenetics. You can have many different versions of a gene that might create 37 degree version. So, you know, that'd be awesome if you drop below 37 degrees, you turn brown and fat all of a sudden. <laughs> um, well, um, out of curiosity, then why was it with the agouti rats that, like, the fat ones were yellow and the skinny ones were brown? Oh, okay, I did that backwards. So, uh, so okay, functioning agouti gene makes you yellow and makes you, you fat. Okay. So, a non-functioning or shut down agouti gene would make you brown and skinny. Okay. Okay? Um, and so that's a relationship. Get it out of your head that if you have a disease, all you need to do is find the gene and then you're done. Okay? If you see that in a newspaper, ground, voodoo curse. Got it? That's it for class today, guys. Um, please take notes on this. Uh, everybody, just say your name and say goodbye. Chartuni. And Julian. Good. And, uh, <laughs> bye. Bye. We still fast. Okay. Uh, Adriana Savdier. Bye. Okay. Ricky Morash. See ya. Peter Rothfuss. Goodbye. Thomas Miguel. Signing out. Claudia Jang. Bye. Okay. Bye. Tang. Bye. Okay. Oh, I'm D. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>